The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Good afternoon. Um, I want to do two things today, uh, and they involve two sets of, of Freudian jargon. I want to talk about Freud's so-called structural psychology that involves the terms id, ego, and superego, and will give me a brief chance to talk about uh, Freud's theory of, of civilization as a whole. And then I want to talk about Freud's developmental psychology, which is uh, where we get these notions of an oral, anal, phallic, and then on to latency in adult stages of, of development. And that will give me a chance to talk about fairy tales, or more broadly, about the, the, um, uh, the, the, the practice of uh, using Freudian ideas to interpret um, literary texts. Uh, the second part may well run into next Tuesday, uh, as I think about it. But um, Freud, Freud thought that babies came into the world thinking that they were coextensive with the universe, that, 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 they, that they were everything. Not that they, not they were looking out in space and saying, look, the stars, they're me. But then when, you know, the initial experience of being a conscious entity was thinking that, you know, you're it, you're everything. Uh, it's not a thought that's new with Freud. I won't attempt to do a reading of the piece of Tennyson that I put on the handout because I discover I'm a bad reader of Tennyson. Um, but, um, but if you read that, you will see Tennyson saying very much the same thing, that it, the job of an infant uh, is to learn the use of I and me and finds I am not what I see in other than the things I touch. You've got to figure out what's you and what's not you. Freud thought this little bundle of... Uh, um, that, that, that this universe of a baby wanted one thing, which we talked about last time. The kid wants pleasure, and the kid wants pleasure now, any way he, she can get it. That collection of unbridled desires is what Freud called the id. Now, this all looks like very fancy, or not very fancy, it looks like jargon, but in Freud's original writing, it's not particularly jargony. It is just a Latinization of the word for it, uh, the animal piece of you, the it that wants stuff and and um, and wants it now. Um, the um, id is essentially unconscious. And well, actually, to combine the two bits of the talk, where 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 does the id get its pleasures? Um, Freud's series of developmental stages were driven by a notion of, of where the sources of, of pleasure were in the kid's life. And so initially, for instance, it's all oral. Um, the fact that these all, you know, that, that, that this all has a sort of a sexual overrun to it was, is in fact probably more problem for Freud than, um, than useful for Freud. We'll come, uh, well, all right, so the kid's getting some, you know, oral stuff. That's what's giving the kid pleasure. Oh, that's sort of interesting. What really is important in this early stage of development, though, is, well, one of the things is figuring out who I am. You know, well, how, how much of this universe belongs to me? And is this universe a safe place? The real, the, 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 the real force behind Freud's stages of development are these are stages where particular issues emerge really for the first time. Issues that will then turn out to be important for the rest of people's lives. So the initial issue that, it, uh, that, that, that comes up in this oral stage of development is, is safety. Am I going to be fed when I need to be fed? Am I going to be warm enough? Am I going to be taken care of? That's, you know, newborn stuff. But it's not stuff that goes away. You know that... Um, concerns about is the world a safe place are the sort of things that can occupy your mind now too. How you understand the world, how you understand those problems, 
says Freud, not unreasonably, are likely to be shaped by these early experiences. If your early experience is of, the, is of a safe, comfortable world, you're going to treat later challenges differently than if your early experience is, who knows if mom's ever going to get around to feeding me again. That's going to be a different kind of experience. Um, the anal stage, all right, why is it anal? Well, it's anal because Freud had some notion that, you know, that there's certain pleasures in, in, in the elimination process and things like that. But the real issue here, the, the, the lifelong issue that emerges, is who's in control? And the reason that's an anal stage issue is because this is the point at which, um, if you're an infant, it's not just anything goes anymore. Up to this point, uh, so, so the, 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 the first great crisis of control in a little child's life is very often toilet training, right? Up to this point, you could do whatever you wanted, wherever you wanted to do it. Now, all of a sudden, somebody's saying, do it there, now, don't play with it, you know, don't do any of the various, it's disgu- it wasn't disgusting before, you know, and I, yeah, in fact, when you, I was very little, you know, yeah, they, they, they looked at it, go, great, oh, yeah, now it's disgusting and I got to put it over there, what's this about? Um, and you got to figure out how much control do you have over yourself and how much, um, how much are you in the control of somebody else? Um, here, the issue is um, identity. Who am I? Identity. Who am I? And, uh, and more specifically, what does it mean to be male or female? Uh, I'll come back to the, uh, to the details of that a little later on because it gets me a little ahead of the story. Um, presently, we're still back here with little Mr. Id this unbridled collection of desires who, who um, uh, you know, wants everything and wants it now. At some point, the id runs up against what Freud called the reality principle, which is you can't get what you want all the time exactly when you want it. If you haven't noticed this at this point, um, that's, that's, that's probably a little grim. Um, the ego which is just the Latinization of the word for I, or the self, the ego is, grows out of the collision of, uh, uh, of this you know, little misid with, with reality. So the ego has to check the, um, the desires of the, um, of the id. And the ego is, 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 the, is, is it sort of the embodiment of this effort to figure out how much of the universe really is me. So the sort of thing you can imagine a kid discovering is, all right, I'm an oral stage baby. I, you know, I like sucking on stuff. There are some things that I can suck on anytime I want. You know, there's this thumb thing. Anytime I want it, it's there. There's other things, like the bottle or the breast or whatever, they don't, they're, they're different. I like them, but they're fundamentally different. They're not me. And you've got to, so, so I mean, at the most basic level, you have to sort of figure out who, you know, how much of the world is you. Now, um, this again ramifies through the rest of your life. If you grow up considering that you are coextensive with the universe and that you make the planets turn in their orbits, you're going to be an odd adult. Right? You've got to shrink it down from that. If you shrink down too far, I'm not in control of anything. You know, this, this didn't work out well for me. I'm not in control of anything. I'm just a little worm pushed around by force. You know, that's not going to be very healthy either. So the job of this emerging ego is to come up with some reasonable estimate of what your powers are and what it is that, that you might be um, in some sort of control over. So, and, and so now the ego is busy there fighting with the id. Um, so the, the id is saying, you know, I want to kill my little brother. The ego says, we can't do that. The id says, how come? The ego says, well, because mom would, would, would whack us. And the id says, I don't care. I still want to kill him. And, and the ego at this point starts to say things like, forget it. We're going to repress that idea. This is where you get the beginnings of ideas of, of repression that I was talking about um, last time. All of these Freudian bits of theories uh, attempt to interlock 
in, in some fashion. So the ego is busy taking the more unacceptable bits of the id and, and stuffing them uh, away in that unconscious uh, reservoir of the repressed. Now you'll see that that's gotten you from an id who just was ruled by pleasure. This really essentially amoral id. You've now got the beginnings of a sense of morality here. Right? It's not very sophisticated, but it's on the one hand, this would be fun. On the other hand, we can't do it because because uh, we might get punished. So it's sort of a reward and punishment. Why not rob the bank? Because you'll get arrested and thrown in jail. It's that sort of crime and punishment kind of um, uh, 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 morality. Morality gets more complicated when you reach this edible stage of, uh, of development. Um, to explain that, I need to say a little more about that stage. Oh, which I can see that on the handout, I promised I would. Um, let, I'll do the male version of this. If this is about uh, uh, identity, and particularly sexual identity, um, there's going to be a male story and a female story. Um, let's do the male story, and we'll come back to the female story. Um, so, the basic notion that, uh, that Freud came to the... Uh, the the, the large-scale notion that makes some degree of sense is that you've got to figure out what does it mean to be a male. That's an important thing uh, to figure out. And uh, it's likely that um, that the dad or other adult males in the immediate vicinity are going to be a sort of a model for what that's going to mean. Um, the difficulty for Freud, or, or, or the, the, the start of the conflict um, in, 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 in an Oedipal conflict, is that the child starts very much attached to mom. It's mom who provides nourishment. Um, it's mom who, was, who, who gave birth to you, and so on. Um, how are you going to get an attachment or an identification with dad? Well, what Freud proposed was that little kids, little boys, stick with boys here, little boys initially see themselves in competition with dad. They like mom. Mom is great. They want mom. All right. It's called Oedipal because Freud saw a parallel with the Greek myth of Oedipus, right? Oedipus who kills his father and marries his mother. So you get this weird notion that somehow Freud thought little boys wanted to sexually possess their mothers. And and that sounds both weird and icky. Um, Freud was, when Freud was, uh, Freud didn't do himself any help here. He was talking about infantile sexuality Everybody heard the sexuality bit and, and sort of left off the infantile bit. Freud is not thinking in any sort of adult sexual terms here. He's saying, look, the little kid likes mom. Mom's a good thing. He wants mom all to himself. Now, it turns out that there's dad. Dad mysteriously seems to have some claim on mom, too. And so the little kid, in this infantile kind of way, figures, we're going to have it out with dad. We're going to have a fight here, man, because there's, there's only one mom, and I want her. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've still got a lot of it going on here. I want mom. And, and, and so we're going to... All right, that's stage one. That's the conflict stage. Um, I can't remember what buzzword I used for the second stage. Oh, the second stage is capitul- capitulation. Well, there's a problem with this conflict. Okay, I'm going to have a big fight with Dad. Dad. Oh, man, like, Dad's really big. If dad ever figures out that I want to have a fight with him, dad is going to kill me. Maybe he's going to castrate me. I'm not sure. But it's something really, really bad is going to happen here. And so I'd better deny that I was ever interested in this. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reject, suppress my desire for mom, and and, and I'm going to idealize dad. I'm going to um, uh, come to take dad as, uh, in, in, in response to this perceived threat, perhaps to my very life, I'm going, to, um, uh, I, I'm going to idealize dad and in some sense incorporate dad into me. And that act of incorporation is, um, is the beginnings of the development of what Freud called the superego. Um, another Latinization, this time of a term that just means sort of over I. You know, the thing that is above the self. Um, it's, uh, 
not quite the con- your conscience. It's not unrelated to your conscience. Um, but it initially, for Freud, starts out as the voice of the father for a little boy. Well, let's just say voice of parent. Um, and will eventually become uh, the voice of the demands of, of, of society as a whole. Telling you how to live. Not necessarily consciously, not necessarily explicitly, but telling you what the rules are. Now, again, you might think that this whole business of a conflict with daddy um, over mommy and the notion that uh, you have some internalized voice of the parent that is going to be the sort of the roots of your morality, your more sophisticated adult morality, that that all sounds a little strange you can get a feeling for why, uh, you know, where such thoughts might come from, again, if you hang around with kids. Remember last time we were talking about the, the, this, you know, hugging your little brother till he turns blue? Well, look, I've, I've now raised three sons through the, the, the Oedipal stage of development. I think every last one of them, at some point in, in the ages of around three, four, the appropriate Freudian age, has hopped into bed some Sunday morning or something like that into our great big huge king-sized bed and asserted, this bed isn't big enough for the three of us. Why doesn't daddy get out? Um, and, and, and mostly what you're sitting there thinking is, no kid should ever be born to a psychologist. What's he doing? Reading the books on the side here? And, and then I'm thinking, you know, what, what am I supposed to do now? You know, am I supposed to like threaten to kill him or something? Because he <laughs> develops morality. Or, but so there, there's that on the. So, so you can really see these sorts of um, uh, seemingly edible uh, uh, comments in in kids of that age, and you can also sometimes hear this voice of the parent as it gets internalized, um, like you know, a, a, a little kid um, who's been told, uh, you know, don't don't uh, you know, the cake's over here, it's for dinner, don't mess with it. And don't go sticking your finger in the chocolate icing again, right? So, no, no, no. You hear the kids saying. The nice thing about little kids is that the, that the, that the superego will verbalize itself for you. Yeah. No, no. Um, so, now, so the idea is that the stress or the, or the trauma of this edible conflict is what drives the superego down into the psyche, almost like a spike from the outside. Um, well, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about Freud's theory about how this works out for women. Um, now, I might be remiss, but you wouldn't be missing anything in terms of... Uh, it, it, people have all sorts of problems with this Oedipal theory business. Um, because, for instance, what happens if you get raised in a single-parent family with just mom? Is there any evidence that your, your development comes out differently? No, in fact. Um, so you don't need dad uh, there. You do need to figure out what it means to be male. Oh, let me say a quick word about, uh, about um, homosexuality. Um, Freud regarded homosexuality seemingly as, he didn't, uh, as a variant of an outcome to this. He did not seem to regard it as, um, as a pathology. So he's got a very interesting letter to, uh, written to a, a, the mother of a gay man. Um, who was, The mother was worried about this. And he says basically, that, you know, there's, there's a bunch of ways this plays out. The main line one is, um, in the words of the old song, you grow up to, you know, I want a girl just like the girl who married dear old dad. That's the sort of ultimate you know, goal of this in, in sort of the mainstream version, you reject your desire for mom, you go into this latent period, you go and you do math for a while, and then you wake up, you know, as, as a sexually mature adult, not looking for your mother, but looking for an appropriate uh, uh, object of your desires. Um, Freud thought that there were other possible outcomes, and they were just other possible outcomes. Subsequent generations of American psychology um, declared homosexuality to be a pathology. And it was only in the 70s that uh, American psychology returned, if you, in a sense, to this, in, to this view that it's a variant, not a problem. Um, 
And, 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 so, oh, women. How do we get to women? Now, what's the problem with women? The problem is that you got to get... You, you need the same fight, thought Freud. He's got himself sold on this edible thing. And you need the same fight, but now you need a fight between the daughter and mom for dad. Right? And the problem is that the initial bonding of the, pair, of, of the daughter is also to mom. So, you know, that's, that's no good because you can't fight with the person you're bonded to. So he's got to get the bond to flip. And so he came up with one of his less credible um, constructs, the one that even good Freudians don't really believe in, um, which is penis envy. What is that? Well, he figured that little girls at some point figured out that they, had, they did not have something that little boys had and that this was a disaster. This was very bad. And they figured out that mom didn't have one either. And therefore, mom was defective, and we ought to, uh, you know, uh, admire dad instead. And then we can go and fight with mom. Ugh. Um, and and plus, plus, this was supposed to be, this was traumatic, this discovery. But it wasn't so traumatic. So Freud also theory, theorized that since it was that trauma that was creating the superego, and, and as a result, adult morality, that it followed that women were simply less moral than men. Um, a conclusion borne out any time you open the newspaper, right? It's not one of the more successful pieces of Freud. But it is the, it is the source of, of my, my favorite really bad experiment in this realm, which was an experiment where somebody gave a, a, a paper and pencil test to a group like you, one of these sort of SAT things where you're filling in the little you know, you know, the, the things with the, with the golf pencils and stuff, and then you hand the thing back and the experimenters don't care a bit about the test at all. All they care about is who returned the little pencils, and more guys returned the pencils than women. <laughs> anyway, it's really lame. <laughs> it was, so look, the broad issue, the broad issue of what does it mean to be a, uh, a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, who is an appropriate, who is going to turn out to be an appropriate object for my sexual desire and so on? Those are interesting uh, questions. Um, there is considerable question about whether the, uh, the, this actual Oedipal conflict, it, there, 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 actually there's very little doubt that the, that, that the strict form of it is not required. The single parent family thing is, 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 is one good bit of evidence against that. And, and, and the woman's story just doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's just kind of whack. Um, but, um, in any case, around this time, you do get this development of, of a more sophisticated morality. And in Freud's view, what you had was a, a, this poor ego here that was on the one side assailed by the desires of the id that wanted to do all sorts of unspeakable and stupid things that you couldn't do in the face of reality. And then there's the demands on the other side of the superego that doesn't want you to, mostly that doesn't want you to do stuff. It does want you to do stuff too. But anyway, it's got its own demands. And, and, and the ego has to somehow thread a path through here. Now, the super ego, how does the super ego let you know what you're supposed to do? The super ego has, well, it says on the handout, does it? Where did I put on the handout? Oh, no, I put a blank. Look at that. Uh, the super ego has a weapon. This is, uh, that lets you know when you've done what it uh, does not approve of. To figure out what that weapon is, you can invoke your own introspection. What you need to do is imagine some activity that your parents would disapprove of. Um, it can be society as a whole, if you like, but parents will do. So think of something that your parents would deeply disapprove of if you phoned up and said, guess what I did? Um, and ask yourself, how would you feel the next day? Th guilty, thank you. I don't know. It's a, a, a guilt is, is the weapon of the, uh, the superego. In, in this view. So when you feel guilty, a good Freudian would say you're feeling guilty because you've done something that transgressed the boundaries set by the superego. Now, look, you know, I went out and I committed murder and I feel really bad about that. Yeah, all right, that's not terribly interesting. The more interesting cases were patients who said, I feel guilty. I don't really know why. 
I just feel this sense of, of guilt. Um, and a, a Freudian would say, well, look, this isn't all conscious stuff. You've apparently transgressed some boundary that you don't quite recognize yourself consciously, but it's there. And, um, and, and we need to figure out, you know, if you want to get over this guilt, we need to figure out what that problem is. Now, how many people here enjoy feeling guilty? All right. So it follows that the, the ego, which is not e eager to sit around feeling guilty, is going to have some defense against that. So, introspection ought to work here too. Let's go back to that, whatever it was that you were going to do, that would be really, really wrong. Now let's suppose you haven't done it yet, but you're going to do it. It's right over there, and you can just go and, and, and do it. How will you feel? Anxious. I heard an anxious over there somewhere. Thank you for the anxious, wherever anxious is. Anxiety is considered to be the defense mechanism um, for... Uh, um, uh, 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 of, of the ego against the, the predations of the, of the superego. Um, so when you feel anxious in this context, the answer is, well, you're pushing up against something that the superego doesn't want you to do. There are... Now, let's go back to the case where I feel anxious, but I don't know why. Classic Freudian uh, view would have been yeah, there's some chunky uh, or super ego that, that, that yeah, you're getting close to their, its rules and it's not happy with you. Um, any reasonable, more modern view would include the possibility that you are just having a, 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 an anxiety attack that we might consider to be more biological than psychological. That there are chunks of the brain that if they are overactive, make you, you know, the, the experience is being anxious. If they are overactive for, uh, you know, essentially neurochemical reasons, you may feel a sort of a disembodied anxiety. It's got nothing to do with whether or not you're about to do something that mother doesn't approve of, but has everything to do with the balance, balance of your, your chemicals. Um, the current position in the pendulum that swings back and forth on, on, on how to handle um, uh, essentially psychiatric issues would be to treat free-floating anxiety as, um, as a essentially biological problem that we might want to medicate um, and would tend to undervalue the possibility that you're feeling anxious for underlying psychological rather than for underlying neurochemical reasons. Um, and of course you can feel anxious for things that don't have anything particular to do with the superego or the imbalance of, uh, of your um, you know, the neurotransmitters. If I stand on the you know, lectern on one foot, I might feel a certain amount of anxiety for this, you know, just because there's a straightforward threat to my personal safety. So there are multiple routes into anxiety, but the, um, within this context, Anxiety is the warning sign that you are, uh, uh, you are embarking on a course that mother would not approve of, or maybe dad, or maybe the broader society um, as a whole. Um, so the result here for Freud is that um, with, with this collection of psychological structures, again, psychological structures, nobody thinks you're going to go into an MRI machine and find the, lo the locus of the superego. Um, but the result of this is that, you don't, that we don't end up raping and pillaging our way uh, across the, 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 the landscape. We sublimate our aggressive urges into things like sports um, or, or work. We sublimate our, the, you know, the, 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 the um, unbridled sexual desires of the id get, get uh, redirected into uh, courtship or into literature or into some other appropriate kind of, uh, of realm. And from, from this, Freud ends up generalizing a theory of, of, of civilization as a whole. He wrote a very interesting book late in his life called Civilization and Its Discontents. Why its discontents? Freud believed that in order to be civilized, you were going to have to, um, you know, fight against your, your 
the desires of your id. Your id was going to be unhappy with you. And you were going to have to fight against the wacko desire, you know, the, the, the strictures of the superego, which were going to be too strict for any normal person to, uh, to hold on to. You were necessarily going to be repressed, dissatisfied, um, and so on. That was the price you paid for, for being civilized. Um, or one way to think about this uh, one, one line from the book is that the, the first man to hurl a spear, uh, sorry, to hurl an insult rather than a spear um, is the founder of civilization. The first man who can redirect that, that sort of id-like desire into uh, something that's consistent with maintaining a, a civilized world, you know, that's where you start to get uh, the possibility of, of, of civilization. Now, I recommend the book to you in part because... Um, it, it, it's, some of it is extremely entertaining um, for all the wrong reasons. Um, not, all, not all of Freud's, uh, de- as, I, as you may have gathered by now, not all of Freud's detailed ideas are really, uh, have stood the test of time. So I cannot resist the urge to, ex- to give you Freud's account of the domestication of fire. Um, which, uh, so so the, the, here's the problem as Freud saw it. You know, fire happens out in the world. Um, what did primitive man do when he saw fire, says Freud? Burned himself. Well, that would be one possibility, yes. So, ah, okay, well, we we, we can follow with this line of, if you weren't going to burn yourself, what might you want to do to that fire? Put it out. If you're a guy, how are you going to put it out? Smack it? No, that's if you're a dumb guy. No, Freud proposed that you would urinate on it. Um, and, that, and, and that this was an essentially sexual act, don't ask me why. Um, but that the first man to renounce that desire, that apparently id-like desire to go and urinate on fire, um, he could bring the fire home. And that, again, would be a, a building block of civilization. Not only that, said Freud, this explains why in, in, in many cultures, women are the keeper of the hearth. Why is that? Well, it's a great deal more difficult if you're a woman to urinate on the fire. It's just not going to work out well for you. So, no, you don't have to believe that. Um, but if you... Uh, it's on page 37, apparently, of my copy of Civilization and its Discontent. Um, but the... The broader thought... I mean, this is, it's, the book is a beautiful example of exactly why I think it's still worth teaching Freud. Um, there's a lot of wacko stuff in there about, about peeing on the fire. But the broader, large-scale thought um, that repression of infantile urges is a price that we pay for civilization um, is, is, is a... Um, is, 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 it seems to me a worthwhile thought to rattle around. And that, the, that as you become more civilized, in a sense, you end up becoming more repressed. Um, that uh, the id's going to sit there trying to escape and you build more and more walls around it um, and you live with more anxiety and more guilt as the price for being, in some sense, um, more civilized. Now, it's a sort of a dark view. It's, an inter- it's interesting that this dark view uh, crops up uh, in his, later in his life. Uh, he had to flee Austria from the Nazis. He was a sick, uh, a, a sick and dying man when he, when he wrote Civilization and its Discontents. It's a rather dark view of, 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 of uh, civilization. Um, you might wonder if this is... All, so, so, let, 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 suppose this is all true in some fashion. Um, well, as it says on the handout, how are you going to talk to the children about this? If these are important issues, and your kid is hopping into bed with you and saying, um, you know, Daddy, get out of bed. I want, you know, I want Mommy, and stuff like that. How do you talk to the kids? Well, I'll tell you how you don't talk to your kids. You don't say, um, you know, I recognize that at this stage in your life, um, that it, it is, you know, uh, that you are thinking that you're in conflict with me, and, and but what you need to realize is that I'm much bigger than you, and if you pursue this much further, you know, you know see the scissors? You know, you're in very big trouble here. Um, yeah, there's not a conversation you want to have with a four-year-old kid, even if you're, even if you're a psychologist. It's just not a good idea. Um, but you could imagine 
that these issues, which are not explicitly understood by, by parents or children, but that these issues about, you know, is the world safe? Is, 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 you know, who, who, who runs the show? What am I? You know, these sort of issues are issues that you're going to want to talk about. Um, and if there's this sort of psychosexual development thing running underneath it, um, those are the issues you're going you're to want to talk about it in those terms. Bruno Bettelheim, following up on ideas in Freud's own writings, uh, wrote a very interesting book called The Uses of Enchantment, in which he argued that it is it, that among other things, fairy tales, um, or more precisely, folk tales, serve the role of a, a, a hidden language or a, a way to talk it to your children in hidden language about these issues. Fairy tales is, a, is an English term. It's a little misleading because fairy tales don't necessarily have fairies in them. Um, but folk tales is the more accurate term. So something like the, 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 the tales of the Brothers Grimm, the brothers did not write those stories. They collected them. They were early 19th century anthropologists wandering around northern Germany getting grandma to tell them stories. And a folk tale is a story that's not explicitly written down for literary purposes. It's a story that's somehow sort of grown up organically from parents telling children and children saying, oh, tell me the one about the witch and the, uh, with the candy house and stuff like that. And these stories, the good ones, get passed on. And Bettelheim says the good ones get passed on because they do this kind of work. They allow you to talk about um, these kinds of... Um, these kinds of issues. Um, I see that I said, what are the characteristics of fairy tales? So I better say a word about um, that. Uh, characters in fairy tales are typically good or bad. They're not, you don't, you don't get, you know, in the woods there was a witch. She wasn't really like, really a horrible person. She was kind of misunderstood and she'd been abused as a child. No, she's a bad witch. She's not a, you know, and, and, and the child, you know, and there, there was a boy, uh, you know, tip, very, very schematic character. Oh, that's the second point, actually. Very schematic characters, often with names like the boy, the girl, um, or, uh, or just a simple descriptor like Snow White, which is just telling you something about how she looks. Um, and, and uh, um, you, you know, she's good, right? It's not that she's got issues or something. She's good. Um, and uh, they're figures that a kid could identify with, typically. This is in contrast, for instance, to myth. Um, you know, Oedipus is not a, a folk tale in this sense. You don't, at age four, you know, say, let me tell you about this cool story where this guy goes off and kills his dad and then marries his mom, and he blinds himself in the end. It's really neat. Um, <laughs> But, 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 you know, you say, ooh, that's really gross. But ask yourself, uh, we're going to do Hansel and Gretel in a minute here. You know, how many people know the story of Hansel and Gretel? Right? I mean, think about Hansel and Gretel um, in those terms. You know, or think about the headlines. You know, Poverty parents ditch kids in wood. Uh, you know, girl, five, cooks old lady in oven. I mean, this stuff is just as gruesome in its own way as, you know, King of Thieves finds out he's married to mom, blinds himself, and wanders off into three more plays by Sophocles. Um, the, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's not immediately obvious that it's just grossness that, it, that, 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 that somehow differentiates uh, myth and, 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 and folktale. But, but the characters are typically something that a kid could... Um, identify with. They have optimistic endings. That clearly distinguishes you from, from Greek tragedy or something like that. At the end of a classic fairy tale, um, good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Witches get killed. Good little girls and boys you know, go home and, and live happily ever after and stuff like that. But at the same time, while they're optimistic in their ending, they do not typically have overt morals on them. That, like uh, Aesop's fables or something like that. You don't get fairy tales that say, you know, they came home after having cooked the witch and, and they said, we'll never go into the woods again or eat any candy ever, ever, ever. Now, you know, it's, it's good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, and... Not, no, no overt punchline at the end. 
Um, an important point is that even if Bettelheim is correct that these are somehow talking in, 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 in this sort of coded Freudian language, parents don't know the language and kids don't know the language or don't know, don't know the... Un- they're, they're, they're doing this all, again, sort of implicitly rather than, uh, than explicitly. Um, and and, and you know, nobody except somebody who took too many notes in intro psych um, you know, says... Uh, let's see, the kid's three, and he was making this cracks about uh, uh, you know, the, the bed and dad and stuff like that. Let's see, I need an edible fairy tale. Jack and a beanstalk, that'll work tonight. The, but the notion is that the kid will be requesting stories that address issues that, that he wants to hear about, and that the parents may find themselves choosing um, stories to read uh, or to tell that, that, that serve the, uh, the issues that are arising in, in, in their minds at the, uh, at the time. Um, now, a lot of this has been somewhat diluted in, in our era because we tend to read fairy tales um, and, or, or watch them on videos where they have been turned into literary constructs um, in ways that they weren't in northern Germany in the 19th century or something. Like that. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little later about um, some of the ways that Disney has modified some of the great fairy tales. They're wonderful things, um, but uh, uh, Bettelheim is very mad about the ones where, where uh, the, 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 the revisions that make nice at the end, you know, Cinderella stories where, where you do something nice for the stepdaughters. You're not supposed to, the stepsisters, you're not supposed to do anything nice for the stepsisters. They're supposed to get their eyes pecked out by crows because they're bad, and bad stuff happens to bad people. She's, you know, Cinderella isn't supposed to arrange for them to marry some duke or something like that. Um, and that makes Bettelheim very agitated. Um, all right, let's, let's talk fairy tales here. Um, so, uh, Hansel and Gretel. Han- Hansel and Gretel um, is in this way of thinking about things, an oral stage fairy tale. Oh, let me say something about that. Oral stage, that's like year one. And you're sitting there saying, I like Hansel and Gretel. Does that mean like I never got out of the oral stage? No, remember the idea here is that the issues that arise in the oral stage about is the world a safe place, for instance, are issues that will persist for the rest of your life. So you're a seven-year-old kid in this view or something, having a, you know, a certain amount of concern about whether the world is safe and if you walk down the street to school, you're going to get hit by a car or something like that. And maybe Hansel and Gretel would appeal on those, on those terms. It's not... Oh, and, and, and another example would be uh, Beauty and the Beast, a female Oedipal story. We will see when I get, if, if and when I get to it. You're saying, I'm a guy... I'm a guy, I like Beauty and the Beast. Is this a problem? No, not part of this is not only do you have to figure out what it means to be a guy, you also have to figure out what it means to be a woman. You don't happen to be a woman, but it would be really interesting to understand what it might mean. And so, again, you might be interested in that particular story, um, not because, you know, some strange path is going on, and blah, blah, blah. No, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, all right, Jack and the Bean, uh, no, not Jack and the Beanstalk, Hansel and Gretel. Um, so what's the issue, uh, oh, wait, wait, let's, let's, let's step back. What's the family situation here? Who have we got as the, as the characters in Hansel and Gretel? Well, there's Hansel and Gretel. Who else do we have? Father, Father and the mother, the stepmother. Is she a good stepmother or a bad stepmother? There are an awful lot of bad stepmothers in fairy stories, fairy, fairy tales. Now, that's a little mysterious. There are a couple of ways to understand this. Um, one of them is to say that in the days when childbirth was a much riskier proposition, many more people had step, stepmothers because mom had died in childbirth, as indeed happens in any, any number of, of fairy stories. And in fact, you can come up with an evolutionary psych argument that says that the stepmother then systematically favors her own genetic children over... The, uh, the, the, the stepchildren. Um, but that's not the, that, that, that's not the Freudian account here. The Freudian account is, look, the initial mother who you encounter when you're a baby is a really you know, good mommy. 
she does everything for you. And she says yes all the time. You know, she just, and you know, you cry, she jumps. It's great. Eventually, mom gets tired of this. And mom starts saying no. And mom starts saying things like, it's time to go, you know, poop in the bucket and not in your pants. And all this other stuff. And that, um, in this view, is the transition between good mommy and bad mommy. And there's so many fairy tales where you get born to a good mommy and then the bad mommy shows up. Way out, out, out of the, out, outside of the range of what would be probable in the, in the population. Um, that you can imagine that, it, that, it, that it's a stand-in for something else. Maybe for a stand-in that you're coming out of this oral stage of, um, of development in this story. All right, so what's the problem? that's faced by our lovely little family unit? What's, what's, what, what's the issue here? Poor. Poor. We're out of money, so... What's the specific result of being out of money? We're, we're, we're a, ha- a few hands would be handy rather than the, 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 the general purpose muttering. No, we've scared them off. What have we run out of here? We've run out... Food! We don't have any food! So we're so the natural thing to do when you've run out of food is to what? Gather some. Well, that didn't work apparently, or at least that was a really boring story. You know, once upon a time there was a mother, a father, and a little boy and girl, and they got hungry and they went out in the field and they gathered mushrooms. And <laughs> unfortunately, they were poisonous and they all died. Um, so that, that 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 was one of those stories that didn't get repeated. You know. Tell me the story about the poison. No. <laughs> so what, what, what happens in Hansel and Gretel? You get rid of the kids. You stick the kids out in the woods. Um, but Hansel hears the plan. Mom and dad are busy discussing this um, in, at, at, at night. And mom, dad, mom, Hansel hears about it. He does what? No, he doesn't run away. That's the Russian version. <laughs> Kills the parents. No. Wait a second, guys. I thought you said you knew this story. Let's get this straight. He, uh, he goes out into the garden. He collects a bunch of white stones. He leaves the white stones behind as a trail. And... Um, no. No, that's the second time. You guys are all going to flunk the final, guys. It's very bad. So, first time it's white rocks. And, and when the moon rises, so you can see the white rocks, they come back. So you've got an oral stage problem. There ain't no food. Um, and the initial crisis where the kids get left in the woods is met with a non-solution. You just return back to the same situation. Second time, same thing. They get abandoned out in the woods, but this time nasty old stepmom has been cagier about it, locked Hansel in, and all he's got is his... Um, uh, bread, and so now he tries what you can think of as an oral stage solution to an oral problem. He leaves this collection of breadcrumbs behind. Does an oral solution solve this problem? Well, no. What happens to the breadcrumbs? The birds eat the breadcrumbs. So there's no breadcrumbs, and they wander around and they fall asleep in the woods. And there's a beautiful chorus in the Engelbert Humperdinck opera, which you should all hear sometime. Gorgeous opera. And Engelbert Humperdinck really was his name. Um, very sad. Um, but, but the opera's lovely. Um, anyway, so the next day they wake up. They're hopelessly lost. They wander around. They're hungry. They're, 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 uh, they're not terribly happy. And they find... The house, right, the house is made of gingerbread and candy and stuff like that. And so like all good little kids, what they do is engage in a little petty vandalism. Um, they, they knock out, a, Han, Gretel eats a window and Hansel eats a, a hunk of the roof. And, and, and then they hear this voice saying, nibbling, nibbling like a mouse. Who's that nibbling at my house? And they respond, the wind, the wind doth blow from the heavens to the earth below. Which makes no sense. <laughs> but anyway, so out of the, out of the out, out comes the. Witch. How do you know she's a witch? Now the way you know she's a witch, it says, is because her eyes glow red. 
This is a tip-off in case this, this, this is practical advice for you. you know, if you're vandalizing somebody's house and, 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 and the owner comes out and her eyes are glowing red, worry about it. Um, but the, the, that, this means that witches don't see very well, which turns out to be handy. They have keen senses of smell, we're told. Anyway, um, this witch... Now, the interesting thing about these, these fairy tales is that you have a problem at home and then um, you are thrust out into, well, in, in the North German versions that the Grimm fairy tales are, into the woods to solve it. Somebody will have to tell me, um, you know, what, what you do if you're reading, I don't know, Saudi Arabian fairy tales, whether you get thrust out into the dunes or something like that. Um, but but it's, the important thing is you go out, away from, you don't solve your problem where it is in, in these stories, typically. You go out and away, and what you find out there in story after story is a, a caricature, an extreme version of the problem at, at home. So here we've got an oral problem. There isn't enough food. Or perhaps, if we're thinking in infantile terms, where's the food come from if you're, if you're an infant? Well, it comes from mom. So not enough food means you've kind of eaten all that you can eat off of mom. And you might worry, what's going to happen if mom wants this back? Well, what you find in the woods is this orality gone nuts because what this witch does is eats little kids. That's her stock in trade. Um, and she's going to eat Hansel, but it turns out he's too skinny for her. So there's this fattening up period. And blah, 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 blah. All right. So eventually, um, it's cooking day, and the witch says to Gretel, climb into the oven, see if it's warm, because we're baking bread, ha ha. Climb into the oven, and, and, and Gretel, who's on to this, says, I don't think I can do that. Can you show me how? And the witch says something like, you silly goose, anybody can do that. She climbs up to the oven and Gretel slams the door on her and she perishes horribly making loud screams. Um, which, you know, not much better than blinding yourself and things like that, but is deeply satisfying in this story. But now you've done some... So, so now they've killed off this symbol of orality and there are two important things that happen thereafter. Um, first of all, what they now discover is that the house is full of gold and jewels. And they stuff their pockets, there's a little, little more looting going on here, but they, they, they stuff their pockets not with candy, not with more oral solution kind of stuff, but now with something that allows them to go home and have moved to a different stage, a stage where in principle they can be contributors, not just consumers. Right. This isn't supposed to be a, an accurate model of, of what happens to, in a one-year-old kid moving out of the oral stage. Oral stage kid doesn't suddenly say at the end of a year, okay, look, like I'm weaned, and now I'm going to go do chores. Um, You've got to understand this in a little more symbolic way. But, but the notion that, you're, that, that the oral, r rather than an oral solution, we've got a different kind of solution. The other thing that's very emblematic here is what do the children find when they get home? Anybody remember? <laughs> The stepmother is dead. Presumably the stepmother is dead at the instant that the witch is killed because they're in a sense one and the same character. Right? They're, they're the, they are the problem. They are the emblem of this, this oral stage problem. It gets killed off and, 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 and everybody's, uh, everybody's good. Um, well, I think before the break, what I will, I'm, I'm going to skip the anal stage. Um, for the present. I promise to come back with an anal stage fairy tale. But what I'm going to do before the break is I'm going to skip to... Um, and uh, th There are lots of edible stage fairy tales. And I'm going to use Jack and the Beanstalk as an example of an early edible stage fairy tale. Um, Jack and the Beanstalk. All right, let's, let's do Jack and the Beanstalk quickly. Jack and the Beanstalk, what's, what's the crisis at the beginning? What, 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 what's Jack sent off to do? Sell the cow. Why are you selling the cow? It's not giving milk anymore. If you want a nice, clear image that you're out of the oral stage, the cow having run dry on you is pretty good. Right? So... Jack's supposed to go off. He's supposed to do the Hansel and Gretel thing, right? He's supposed to go from the, 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 the dried up cow thing and get some money so we can go do the, the, the food thing the other way. Um, but what's he do? He trades it for magic beans. 
Yeah, all right. He comes home. Is mom happy about this? No. no. So, what, oh, what happens to Jack? He gets sent to bed without any supper. Another sort of end of oral stage kind of, uh, of image. And mom does what with the beans? Throws them out the window or sows his wild oats or something like that. In any case, something grows really big at night in this story. Right? And it, you don't have to be a vastly Freudian imagination to think that it you know, looks a little phallic here, maybe. Anyway, you wake up in the morning and there's this giant beanstalk. <laughs> Climbs up the beanstalk. You climb up the beanstalk, what do you find at the top of the beanstalk? You find another, just like in Hansel and Gretel, you find a cartoon version of what was at home. You find, so you find the castle, which is just the house, and who lives there? Well, who does he find when he gets there first? The giant's wife, or the ogress's wife, who's the stand-in for mom. Is she bad? No, she's really very nice. They have a very nice relationship. They're playing all day. The problem is... Fee-fi-fo-fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead. I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Otherwise known as, Dad has come home. <laughs> this, is, uh, th- 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 this, this is a sort of a... Mo- oh, one, one of the things that's sort of interesting here is that... This models a classic sort of nuclear family with mom, uh, a stay-at-home mom. That, um, that and, and you can sort of imagine, you know, in the context of this Oedipal con- uh, conflict. So here's the son. All day long he gets to play with mom. You know, mom's cool, mom's great. And then this ogre, big dad, comes home. And, and, and uh, 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 you know, he wants mom, and he wants dinner, and he wants, he wants to grind up little kids and stuff like that, which is a little strange, but, um, you know, it, it is an image of the situation that a young child might find himself in. Now, you might wonder whether in a few more generations our fairy tales will have to change in response to the, uh, um, you know, in, 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 in my family... Uh, you know, both of us were out of the house working. I mean, so, so that the, the, the you know, nice, nice giantess at home model isn't going to quite work. You sort of wonder whether or not in a few day, a few, few years, the the, the, uh, the the few generations or something, you know, Jack will be there with the with with, with, with the nice daycare provider or, or something like that, and, and the mom and dad giants will come home at the end of the day. You know. With the, no, fee, fi, fo, fum, let's microwave the little bum, or something like that. Um, the, uh, but in this, in this version, in this version, you got dad, he comes home, and, and, and there's, so, the, 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 the dad's standing. And so what does Jack do? Well, first of all, the, the mother hides him in, 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 in the oven, which is a sort of a womb-like symbol, which is rather nice. Um, but he goes off and steals stuff from dad, from, from the giant. He, he spends all of his time ripping dad off here and, and, and basically being in conflict with dad. Eventually, he tries to steal dad's golden harp, um, which is bad because the thing makes a racket. We got the goose out there without the problem. Goose that lays the golden eggs. Good thing to steal. Um, kept the goose quiet, but the harp made him know. Anyway, the giant catches on to this. And, and um, what's he do? What, what's Jack do? <laughs> Didn't understand a word of that. Where's Jack go? Back down the beanstalk. What's he do with the beanstalk? He chops it down. And either, it depends on the bird, either, either dad crashes or, or, or the, the giant crashes or not. But in any case, it's, um, what he, if, if this was a full blast Oedipal story, right, you'd be going, you know, uh, and, and get to the point where you go off and, for instance, marry the princess or something like that. This is a partway Oedipal, you know, a, a, a not all the way through the story thing. You get that beanstalk and you get rid of it. Man, I'm, either it's sort of a reversion back or it's going into a latent period. None of this stuff that grows in the night. Nothing, man. We're done with that for the time being. Nothing good happens here. Large, big guys chase me around when I do anything of that. And forget it. So it's a story that doesn't get all the way through to the end of this, um, 
this whole psychosexual story that, 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 that Freud's weaving. Um, so let's see here. Classic male. All right. Well, I, I, I've already given you a hint that classic male Oedipal stories are those stories where you do end up marrying the princess. I'll say a bit more about that in, in, in a minute, but let's take a short break because otherwise I'll never get to the end of this. Don't worry, no answer on the final would require you to know the details of the story. Um, but, but what you should, and I hope I'm telling enough of the story that you can get the feeling for how it maps back and forth to the, um, you know, to the bits of Freud. Um, the, but if, if, if you happen to be fond of the sort of fairy tale literature, the, the Bettelheim book is a lot of fun to read. I keep looking for, I mean, it's, it's now, how old is it? God, it's 25 years old. I read that sucker when it came out the first time. Anyway, um, I keep looking for new stuff to read on it, and there's nothing as good. It's, 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 you know, it's fun to read. In the full blast, in the full blast male version Oedipal, sta- uh, Oedipal fairy tales, um, there are endless ones of these, and they are of the form. They're very typically of the form. Not the, 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 the lead character is typically somewhat older, often described as a prince rather now than as a boy, um, and. Um, Rather than being like abandoned in the woods, he is now thrust out of doors by his father for some crime or other. He has to go out into the world. He's at home in this Oedipal conflict. Um, they, they reach the crisis in the conflict and dad literally says, I'm going to kill you. The king says, I'm going to kill you or something. And he's got to go out into the world. And he goes out in the world and has adventures. What he does out in the world Um, in these stories is very typically to kill a stand-in for the father. In Greek tragedy, you may kill your father. In a fairy tale, you kill the ogre, the dragon, the giant, something that stands in for the father. And um, the reason you're doing this is because the ogre, the giant, or the dragon has in his possession what? A princess. She's a... a, 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 Almost always a princess who thinks that the prince is really quite nice and, 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 and all that. So, and, and not mother. You don't go out and rescue your mother from the dragon. It just, it just doesn't happen. Right? What you're going to go out in, in one of these stories and do is find an appropriate mate. Not the inappropriate edible conflict stage mate. You're going to go out and find the princess, um, kill the dragon. You're going to then bring her home. And everything's going to be good. And in fact, at this point, typically in one of these stories, um, the king will not die, but will retire. And, and the Prince Charles in England has been waiting for this for years. Um, but it's never worked out for him. But, but, uh, um, but you, know, the prince, the, you, you come home with the right, the right princess, and, and, and the king retires, and you get to rule the roost. That, that's getting through all the way to the end of the story. Now, female Oedipal stories... Are, are different in interesting, uh, in interesting ways um, because of the difference in the traditional family structure. Right? If in the male structure, you've got um, the, the giant in Jack and the Beanstalk who comes in uh, only intermittently because the primary caregiver is the mother. If you, the, the female's got the conflict with the primary caregiver. So you have... Um, uh, in, in these sort of stories, the girls who are captives of nasty older women in some, in some fashion or other. So let's look, for instance, at Snow White. 
Snow White, another one of these names where the name, does, it's just a generic term, right? She's white as snow and got hair as black as, a, as coal or something, I don't remember. Anyway, lovely mother, lovely mother dies. Uh, the um, husband, the king, remarries, uh, remarries a, uh, uh, another lovely woman, but a very jealous one. The jealous stepmother has what cool device? The mirror. The mirror made famous most recently in Shrek endlessly. But in, in um, the cool thing about the mirror in, um, uh, in Snow White is it speaks not literally but figuratively with the voice of the little girl. Initially, when the stepmother asks, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of us all? The mirror says, you. It's you. The voice of the little girl saying, look, I idealize you. You're my mother. You're the greatest thing since sliced bread. A little later, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of us all? Well, look, Queenie, you look pretty good for a woman of your age, but have you seen Snow White? You know, she is a blossoming young woman here, and, mm, and well, anyway, this drives, this drives this, this, the nasty old stepmother nuts, and in the best tradition of Oedipal stories, she decides to do what with Snow White? Kill her. Um, and, uh, Oh, another characteristic of, of female Oedipal stories is that the dad tends to either be absent or useless. The king does nothing here. The other dad, Standin, who's the huntsman, who the queen gives to um, uh, gives Snow White to to have, him, have her killed, um, she, the, 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 the huntsman fails both the queen and Snow White. Disney's actually quite close to the original story in this one. Um, the huntsman takes her out into the woods, doesn't have the heart to kill her, but also doesn't have the guts to save her, so throws, you know, loses her out in the woods, basically. He goes off and kills what? A deer. A deer. Does what? Cuts, Cuts out his heart. Its heart. Brings it home. The queen does what? She eats it. Oh. Nice woman. <laughs> um, anyway, so she goes off into the... Um, she goes off into the woods. Um... In, uh, and, and what does she find out in the woods? I ho, I ho, wish. She finds a lovely little encapsulated anal stage fairy tale is what she finds. <laughs> she finds, look, you know, if you had... The, the, the women will, it, it will, will have some intuition about this. If you told your mother, Mom... I found this really great housing arrangement at MIT. I'm going to go and live with seven hairy guys. <laughs> would mom be thrilled? No, she would not be. If, however, they're the dwarves from, from, from uh, um, Snow White, even though the, the ones in Grimm aren't, aren't, aren't sleepy and dopey and whiffy and waffy and whatever they are in, in Disney, you wouldn't worry about it because these guys are, are you know, they're, they're little asexual guys. There is no sense of threat here at all. And, and what, they, what do they like to do? They like to dig stuff out of the dirt, put stuff back in the dirt, dig stuff out of the dirt, put stuff back. And, and they're devoted to Snow White. They think she's great. Um, but they're, they're, they're a little anal stage fairy tale tucked in there. Um, and, and so the problem is that the mirror uh, rats out Snow White, right? You know, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of us all? Yeah, yeah, queen, you look great. Guess who's, you know, blossoming down in the woods with a bunch of little hairy asexual guys. Um, <laughs> So she disguises herself, the queen disguises herself, um, and goes off in an effort to kill Snow White. Um, she tries three different times, um, and they are interestingly emblematic of an effort to keep a girl from turning into a woman. The clearest one of these is the corset that she sells. She goes as a peddler woman um, and, and sells Snow White a corset that, that, that restricts her. So squeezes her body back into a little girl body so hard that she can't breathe it oh, falls over dead um, and or semi dead this, and, and, and you know, always at the last minute hi ho hi ho and the dwarves come back and she's she's dim you know after the you know, it's, it's one of these sort of fool me once shame on me things but three times she goes and falls for the you know old lady thing um, and the last time it's with this um, Adam and Eve kind of apple Right, she eats the apple, the dwarves come home, and she's dead and they can't do anything about it. 
Now, what would the natural thing be to do under those circumstances? Bury her, right? Or something. You know, she's dead. What do they do? They put her in a glass coffin. They can't, it says they can't bear to bury her. They put her in a glass coffin and uh, put her in, in, in a clearing in the woods. Um, which... <laughs> And, 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 and it says in the story that she continues to grow into a beautiful young woman, which is a, a lovely image of a latency stage, right? Nothing's happening, but she's turning into a sexually mature woman is what's going on here. You would think that the dwarves might catch on, right? There's something weird here, guys, um, that, that you know, normally you know, the dead body thing, you know, it doesn't work like this. But anyway, the dwarves don't. She's getting beautiful. And, and through the woods comes the prince. prince. Um, the prince does what? Nah, the prince doesn't kiss her. None of that stuff. What the prince does, and I, I, I can't remember if he does this in, in, the, in the Disney version, but in the traditional version, the prince orders the dwarves to bring the coffin to his castle. What is he thinking? You know, this would be a really cool coffee table. I mean, it's, it's very weird stuff. But... What happens is the dwarves who have been extremely careful all along, the dwarves trip, the castle, uh, the castle, the, the, the coffin shatters, and, and um, the apple pops out of her throat, and she, she, she's alive, she's fine. Um, this is a story that doesn't quite get all the way through to adult sexuality in the sense that the story ends without her saying that she loves the prince or anything like that. It says... He was nice, and so she went with him. It doesn't quite get you all the way through. Um, the classic stories that get you all the way through to the end of the story are the so-called, and on the female side, are the so-called animal groom stories. I don't have time to do um, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, really, but Little Red Riding Hood is a story where all men are beasts, and they stay beasts. Um, the classic versions of female Oedipal stories that get you all the way through to the end of the story are the ones where the beast is redeemed by the love of a good woman. The, you know, one class of these is kiss the frog and it turns into a prince. But let's do Beauty and the Beast. Um, now, Beauty and the Beast in the Disney version is a wonderful movie about female empowerment or something like that, but it's a long, long way from the original folktale version of it, unlike the Disney Snow White. So let me tell you a little more about the, uh, the, the, the version that um, is in, uh, in, in Grimm's fairy tales, um, if, uh, um, if, you don't, if you aren't familiar with it. So in, in, in Grimm's fairy tales, or in the classic uh, Beauty and the Beast story, um, uh, there's no, you know, for starters, there's no reason why the beast is a beast. He's been, and in, in, in these stories, typically, the beast in, in, in the Disney version is a beast because he's got no love, and he's, you know, he, 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 was, a, he was a nasty to the, to the whatever she was who showed up at the door and stuff like that. None of that in the traditional version. He's a beast because some older woman said, you're a beast, in, in the all men are beasts school of beasthood. Um, and so when, when, we, when we start out with, with, with Beauty and the Beast, Beauty is at home with her two sisters. Uh, no mom on site at all in this one, but there, there's, there's dad, um, and dad's going off on a trip. Not because he's got some wacko cool invention. He's just going on a trip. And he says, what do you want me to bring back? And you know, one greedy old sister says, oh, bring me you know, a Mercedes. And the other one says... You know, bring me a, a fur coat. And Beauty, who's a bit of a sap, says, Oh, just bring me one rose. So anyway, he does well on the trip, and he gets the Mercedes, and he gets the fur coat, and he forgets the rose. Right? So he's um, coming home, and he passes this ruinous castle, and there's a rose bush, of course, and he says, Nobody's going to miss one rose, right? So he goes and picks the rose. So, bad move. Because out comes, um, and, and you know, I'm, you, know, you picked my rose, now I'm going to kill you, which seems a little disproportionate, but you know, he's a beast after all. Um, and, and, and so the daddy explains way more than he should be under the circumstances. He's, you know, I, I, I just picked one for my daughter, he lives over there. And, 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 uh, 
The beast says, okay, fine, I won't kill you, send me the daughter. <laughs> dad says, okay. <laughs> now, to give dad, there, 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 there are two ways of looking at this. One of them is, is that dads very traditionally in animal groom stories are the person who, in a sense, walks the daughter down the aisle here. The other way of thinking about this more charitably about dad is that dad's thinking, I'm just getting out of here, man. I'm not going to send my daughter back. But um, he goes home, he tells the story, and, um, and very much like in, in the Disney version, Beauty says, hey, you gave your word, I got to go. And so she goes off to, uh, to, to live with the beast. Now, the beast, well, he's a beast, but he, he's kind of like a gentleman. Um, he's not really a bad beast as these things go. They live a perfectly reasonable life there in this scrungy castle. Um, every night after dinner, uh, he says, will you kiss me? And she says, oh, yuck, you're a beast. And he doesn't press the issue, right? And they just go on like this for a long, long time. And eventually... Um, she gets a postcard or something. Oh, no, I guess she gets, guess she gets the wedding invitation. She gets an invitation that says, your, your sister's getting married. Why don't you come home for the wedding? Um, and the beast is reluctant to let her go, but says, you can go um, as long as you come back within a month or I'll die. Um, so she goes home and a big, long party, I guess, because she forgets all about it. And in various versions, there's the, the magic mirror in some versions of it. In, in, in any case, at, 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 on the 31st day, she uh, either looks in the mirror or realizes in a dream or something that the beast is dying, the castle is in ruins, the beast is dying, um, and she wishes herself back there. She's magically transported um, back there. She, nobody gets to get killed on the roof in the rain or anything like that. She, um, she realizes that she does love this, uh, this beast and kisses him and kaboof, now he's, you know, he's, he has been redeemed by the love of a good woman and he's no longer a beast. And you've gotten through all the way to the, um, uh, to the end of the story. So Little Red Riding Hood there's no sense that she's going to go marry the beast. In Little Red Riding Hood, what you've got is the situation where um, Little Red Riding Hood says to the, to the um, uh, when confronted by the, the beast on the road, in effect, she says, I'm much too young for you. I'm an inappropriate uh, sexual object. Why don't you go see Grandma? She's a much more experienced woman. Um, and, oh, wait, you, 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 Go read your Little Red Riding Hood again. Little Red Riding Hood gives way too much... You know, if you go and meet a stranger, a bad, scary stranger, and he asks a bunch of questions, you're not supposed to say, I live, or grandma, I'm going to Grandma. She lives at 400 Shady Brook Lane. Um, and I think she leaves the back door unlocked. You know, that's more or less what Red Riding Hood does. And then... Um, so, and, and, and so what's the, what does the... the um, the, the, the wolf does is goes, goes there and gobbles up grandma, gets into bed, um, and, then, uh, and, and then gobbles up Little Red Riding Hood, um, who ex- is later delivered by cesarean section, more or less, um, and describes the whole experience as yucky. You know, not, not scary or anything, it was just all sort of gross. Um, and and, uh, oh, and, and when, when, the be- when the wolf is... Uh, is, is Captured by the huntsman daddy, he's dis- the wolf is described as you old sinner. You know, what's that about? Anyway, it, it, it's the Little Red Riding Hood ends with Little Red Riding Hood saying, I will never go off the straight and narrow again. Because the wolf's been saying, you know, go smell the flowers, go off the track and stuff like that. So that's a story where you don't get through the whole thing. If you, if you wanted to write a Little Red Riding Hood story, you know, you wanted to morph it into a full blast story, um, I suppose it'd be a little crass if Little Red Riding Hood had to go and marry the guy who killed Grandma. That's a little gross, but he'd end up, she'd end up kissing the wolf at the end, and the, and the wolf would turn into um, into something nice. Um, there's a great MIT fairy tale, the Tool and Die fairy tale, but you'll have to ask me about it some other time. 